Hi, my name's Toby. I'm with Venture Out Nursery, and today we are here to talk to you about how to evaluate and make pruning decisions on your apple, pear, and Asian pear trees, spur bearing trees. If you haven't watched our video on how to identify fruiting wood, then you might want to pause this one, pop over that one, and then jump back here for more information. So it's February in the Pacific Northwest, and this is the prime time to finish up your winter pruning if you have not yet done that. So there's one thing. Okay, so this is an apple tree. It's pink pearl, not that that matters too much. Um, and this is a tree that was trained carefully for the beginning of its life. And then through a change of ownership, it was uh, left with some strangely patterned maintenance. Doesn't matter, but a lot of us hit that situation in our lives, in our gardens. So the cool thing about this tree um, is that it has been started out with a really great scaffold in its life. So let me pause for a moment on that and say, when we are growing fruit trees and when we are making pruning decisions in our fruit trees, one of our main goals is to maximize light penetration throughout the canopy. And so by using a very distinct tiering layer like this tree has, when that's maintained property, we have really excellent light penetration. The other thing we want to do when making pruning decisions on our fruit trees is to keep the fruit close into the trunk and also keep the fruit close into our scaffold branches. So if we let these branches grow out, grow out, grow out, grow out, and our fruit load is at the ends, then we risk breakage. So by keeping everything tight in, close to home, we get nice, strong, sturdy branches that can hold plenty of fruit. Of course, we will want you to be thinning your fruit, but that's another matter. Um, so this tree has nice level of containment, so it's all tight in, and it's also got some nice tearing someone did come through here last year after summer and they did some whacking on the bottom of this but they didn't get to the top so as we prune this today we're going to start with understanding how to prune so that you favor the formation of fruit trees sorry not fruit trees we're pruning fruit trees so that you favor the formation of fruiting spurs and then we'll talk about cleaning up the layers and how to maintain the layers. So, first off, if we look at the canopy of this, the crown of this uh, apple tree, we can see that there is a lot of water sprouts. So water sprouts are when um, shoots come up from the top of the canopy. And most of them are at least two years old. So this one, we see these little side spurs telling us that this is a two-year-old and the tip is one-year-old. And then some of them <clears throat> are even three. So we've got shoots that came out and got really long. And so we can force many of these shoots to begin to provide us with fruiting spurs, flowering buds. Okay, so before we talk much about that, I'm gonna do a quick refresher on what's the difference between a heading cut and a thinning cut and why you care. So, a thinning cut is when we take a branch and we follow it to its place of origin on the branch and we cut it carefully off. That's a thinning cut. Thinning cuts are what I hope you will use mostly when you're pruning ornamental trees. Fruit production trees uses a whole different kind of pruning that is different and will uh, not make an ornamental tree pretty. So the rest of this video is very specific to fruit tree pruning and don't use this for pruning your beautiful ornamental trees. Because in fruit tree pruning we use a whole lot of heading cuts. Heading cuts are when you take a branch from the tip and you just cut 
with strategy, but you don't go all the way down. So that's a heading cut. We just started out and we headed it off instead of following it to its point of origin and thinning it. Heading cuts trigger a growth response. All pruning can trigger a growth response, but in particular, heading cuts trigger a growth response. So where I make that heading cut, the buds below it are going to be stimulated to grow. And this is important. So when we decide where to make our heading cuts, we need to be remembering and using as a strategy the likelihood that we will be triggering buds to break. That's when a quiet little sleepy bud shoots out and makes a shoot. Because you can encourage what we call blind wood or wood that doesn't have growth coming from it. So when the buds are just sleeping and above it, there's more active growth. So like if you look at this stem, you've got buds here that are, have not broken and then you have shoots up here and then we had more growth that got pruned off up there. So, so we'll just pause that as the concept. So when you have growth like this on a fruit tree, like I said before, you want to keep your growth and your fruiting wood close in, right? So this tree is starting to develop mature growth that could become fruiting wood, but it's way up here and that's not where we want it, right? One great thing about this tree is it is all at a reachable height. So when I want to pick an apple, it's right here for me. I don't have to climb up on a ladder. And because fruit trees get better with age, humans, maybe not so much. The older we get, the harder it is to do some of that maintenance. So I like to keep my fruit trees most easily reached from the ground. So that means I don't want my fruit wood way up here. I want it down close. Okay, so what's to be done? By making a heading cut strategically on a shoot, we can encourage the buds below the cut to break. So then if we remember back to that video I've encouraged you to watch, the first time that this bud breaks, it's going to make a vegetative shoot, right? No flowers or fruit yet. But then when we cut that back a little bit, we will encourage what we leave of the shoot to break buds that will become flowering and fruiting spurs. And we're going to see that in action. So for instance, well, we can actually look down here to see what's happened. So these are not cuts that I made and many of them are bad cuts that aren't healing well. We can talk about that in a few minutes, but basically this shoot grew, somebody headed it back right here. That encouraged these shoots to grow and then someone headed them, which encouraged the buds left to poke out and that this is developing fruiting wood. Now all these little things are becoming fruiting wood. So when we have a long shoot like this one, it already has some side shoots beginning. So we can encourage these to grow long by making a heading cut, such as this. That's even a little far out. I might go down a little farther because I have this shoot, but I also have this and I have this whole length. So when I prune here, and also I'm going to prune here, I am going to stimulate these shoots to develop right here. I'm going to encourage these buds to shoot and develop. And what will happen is that this bud will elongate with vegetative growth, but these buds will begin to develop flower buds. 
So when you're pruning your apple tree or your pear or your Asian pear tree, you want to think about minimizing the vegetative wood, but leaving enough buds behind for growth to be guided to create mature fruiting spurs. So now let me cut some shoots. I'm gonna do a little cleanup and we can talk more. And I think that as we go, you'll understand this better. So here we go. Okay, so that was a bit of decluttering. And what I did, I missed a few shoots, but what I've done is I've mostly removed all of the excess height and shade that was caused by all of those long shoots. So I'm controlling the height and I'm controlling the light and I am gonna do more on this, but I am also taking away the non-productive wood, and I am, tr I am looking to encourage the formation of more fruit spurs by leaving wood that will mature. So that's one of the first things you can do. So you can see I wasn't putting a whole ton of thought into making those cuts. You can, if you don't know what else to do, you can simply go through and leave two to three to five nodes, and you won't have messed yourself up right so you can just leave that much and um, you will have future fruit wood you've left your old fruit spurs and you should be good to go now we need to take it a few steps further so we want to think about um, one of the best ways for disease prevention is to uh, have airflow in the tree and for maximum fruit ripening quality, we want to also have lots of light penetration. So this tree um, did, it was trained with these nice scaffolds and then some of that has kind of been let go. We also have some damaged wood in here, which we should get rid of because a site like this is a good spot where disease can get in there. Um, Things like codling moth can lay their eggs and overwinter there. And so we don't want to have wood like that. And we also want to be looking at what growth is creating shade for other growth and what we should keep and leave. So we want to look for things like these branches right here. So we've got a big cluster in this area where this branch is growing on top of this branch, is growing on top of this branch. There's also plenty of fruit spurs. So if everybody were to make a fruit, there would be too much fruit in this area of the tree and the shading would prevent that fruit from becoming good quality. We have a lot of crowding up top where we have far more shoots than we need to keep. So not only do we want to knock them back, but we then will go through and thin them out. We also have some bad cuts that have been made. I'm not sure if this was deer that pruned this tree in the past or um, anyway. So there's a little bit of uh, wounded wood, disease wood to clean up in here. And then also you can see this growth is kind of long and tatty. It's hard to maintain under a tree this low. So I'm going to work a little bit on lifting that canopy up. So reducing shading, improving maintainability, reducing crowding. One of the ways that you can encourage the production of quality fruit on a tree is to limit the amount of fruit it can set. So a professional orchardist will count 
bud sites and they have very technical formulas, not so much in the home orchard, but something to just understand is you don't need to keep every single branch that the plant makes and every single fruit spur. And so we will do some thinning of that so that we control the number of sites that fruit can come from. And then you follow that up in summer by thinning the fruit. So every flower can make one to three fruits. We don't want all of that. So you'd want to thin so that each like area of the tree is only trying to ripen a couple fruits. And that's how you get better fruit. So now we'll start with phase two of this work. All right, I think that this tree is good for this season. So what I have done, I've limbed it up a little bit, not much, a couple big cuts to limb it up. I have tried to reduce shading. I've tried to pull out the majority of the growth that's kind of floppy and flimsy. Um, I have headed back all of the shoots to encourage them to make fruit spurs. This is a multi-year process. Um, I have tried to open up so that there's light penetration everywhere. And I've tried to balance it with the thought that this is a tree that had not seen much work for a few years. And so um, this is a lot for this tree, but also they can handle it when we're talking about fruit tree production pruning. So. This is my version of this finished apple tree. I hope that this has helped you understand how you might make some pruning decisions in your orchard and what a finished fruit tree might look like. There's many different ways to prune depending on where you are on the scale of hardcore commercial pruning to just soft, gentle gardener. Um, so this is one interpretation, but I hope it helps. Thanks for watching and happy gardening.